Okay, uh, let's see if I can uh, get this in, in 10 minutes. I, I told you I'm trying to lighten up a little bit. Um, stories about David. I, I had asked you to, to see, uh, to watch the scene about David killing Goliath in uh, King David. That should be underlined with Richard Gere. And I gave you that channel. Uh, I, I hope that worked for you. That was part three. I'm going to want you to go back to that movie uh, in a little bit. And I'll, I'll tell you about this in a second. But <clears throat> anyway, I'm drawing these stories from Samuel 1 and 2. I think of these as the David stories, and I believe I already had some things, had you write some things like with Goliath, with Jonathan, with King Saul, David's sling. Well, uh, after that, it's just some stories here. After uh, David had done that, uh, uh, King Saul gave him his daughter as his first wife, Princess Michael. Oops, Michael, it should be spelled like that, I think. Uh, you usually think of that as a uh, man's name. I always say princess because I want to make sure they realize that it's a woman, Princess Michael. That was his first wife. I don't think they ever got along too well. Uh, but anyway, uh, David uh, got so popular with the people and Saul was going crazy that at a certain point out of nowhere, Saul uh, grabbed a spear and threw it at David and almost killed him. He was, he was staying at the palace. Uh, so David had to run. He had to flee. And Jonathan helped him. Uh, and he's, here he was, the good outlaw, David the good outlaw. I think I had you put that down as, as on your list of uh, archetypes. Uh, anyway, while he's uh, in the mountains, he gradually gathers up a, a small army around him and followers. He marries a woman named Abigail. There's a really neat story about Abigail, a very common girl's name. Abby, Gail, both common girl's names. Uh, so... Um, but, uh, and another story, I, I say I'm going quickly. The thing to do is, is get uh, a Bible and read these if you want to know these stories well. At one point, uh, Saul tries to get David up in the mountains, and, and David uh, could have killed him. He, he got into the cave, I think, where King Saul was sleeping, and took his cloak and cut a piece of his cloak off, showed it to him up on a rock, and then Saul left him alone. Well, anyway... Uh, uh, Saul goes to battle. He's crazy. He foolishly goes to battle. He shouldn't have done it. Uh, in the battle, Saul and all his sons are killed. Uh, and uh, I really want you to see this part, this in King David. Uh, uh, if you go to this, uh, GG4029, put, uploaded May 26, 2011, that shows the part that I want you to see. Uh, uh, this would probably be a better uh, place to see it, but I don't know what part it is. But it, it shows that battle. I like to show kids that because I like them to see how... It's fairly realistic, I think, uh, the, certainly the costumes and the set and the equipment of what a battle might have looked like in the Bronze Age back in the time of King David. Well, um, why I especially want you to see that, though, is because the way that film was made, there are two literary devices that are so effectively used. One of them, and the literary devices, it seems to me this is maybe six, section 6.1, and you should add this if you haven't already. A split storyline. Well, that's when you keep more than one story going on at the same time. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, I, I mentioned it, I think, when, uh, when uh, Moses was up on Mount Sinai and the people down below. Well, they keep more than one story going on at the same time. Well, in that film, Saul, busy dying, killing himself, and Jonathan being killed, uh, is being shown at the same time that David, up in the mountains waiting for news, days later, uh, is, is going to receive the news. Um, um, and uh, Jonathan runs toward his father, a messenger runs toward David, Jonathan is struck uh, by a rock, David is struck by the thought that this is bad news, he stops, David's, uh, John, Jonathan is still, David is still, Saul grabs a sword, David grabs a sword. You're jumping back and forth between the two stories. And the two actually overlap. The soundtrack overlaps. So both Saul in his suicide is screaming and David in his grief is screaming. Uh, uh, I, if I could, I would somehow be showing you all about this and stopping. But if, if, if you are driven by intellectual curiosity, you'll certainly go to this. Uh, uh, so anyway, Saul's death in the movie King David. Uh, now soap operas uh, do this all the time. Uh, they have split story lines. One of my favorite authors as a, as a kid was, uh, was Edgar Rice Burroughs in his science fiction, and he did it all the time too. Uh, Lord, of the, uh, Lord of the Rings, in the second book, uh, The Two Towers, this is so effectively done as the characters 
are in different places and different stuff is going on. Anyway, split storyline. But the other thing is parallelism. In that same scene, those two stories are being shown in such a parallel way. I already told you, Jonathan's running, David's running, Jonathan's still, David's still. Saul has a sword and he's screaming, David has a sword and he's screaming. Uh, that was very carefully done. That's called parallelism. Uh, so I say, for example, Saul's Ibid. That would, you would read that as Saul's death in King David. Another example, this doesn't have to do with literature so much as grammar, but if you say, I like swimming and to ski, that's a mistake in parallelism. That's not good style. You should say, I like swimming and skiing. Or you can say, I like to swim and to ski. Either one is fine because it's parallel. Uh, but we don't tend to, we like to prefer, we prefer things that are parallel. And you can see it being used in literature. All right, finally, I think I, w I am going to make this. Uh, the, after that death, the, the movie then goes to David about to dance in front of the ark. And the words that you hear, how are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished. Uh, uh, those are words from a lament that David, uh, David's lament. I have his lament for Jonathan. He didn't only compose psalms, he also composed a lament for Jonathan, a lament for Absalom, his son later. Um, and a lament is a poem expressing grief uh, over someone's death. And there is an example of it, David's lament. Uh, uh, a, no, a modern day example that is very well known is uh, Eric Clapton's uh, lament for his son. It's called Tears in Heaven, a very popular song. Kids usually know it. Uh, well, I'd like you to see, uh, hear those words and watch David dancing. The Bible says he danced naked up through the streets of uh, Jerusalem. Why? Because he was so excited bringing the Ark of the Covenant into his capital city. Uh, uh, now in the movie he's kind of still got a diaper sort of on him, but, uh, but I think as far as the Hebrews are concerned that was as good as naked. Um, anyway, uh, uh, I like the kids to see that uh, for a reason later on. He's dancing to deal with his great joy uh, also, uh, the costumes and the set and the way he dances, and you get a good view of the Ark of the Covenant uh, when it's uncovered. David didn't have a temple. He had to use a tabernacle, keep it in sort of a tent. So this, uh, uh, David's death, uh, or Saul's death, you, you can find on that site right there, David dancing, it's there various places. Sometimes it's in a foreign language on YouTube. If you just look up David dancing, You'll probably find it, at least if you put Richard Gere there. What I'm hoping is that this channel, if you just find the right part, uh, you could find it there. All right, uh, that, that should be enough for today. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow.